Welcome to Myerstown Church of the Brethren this Sunday, May 3rd. It's good to have you with us. Just, just uh, one quick announcement this morning. Um, we had our first Bible study uh, this past Monday and went well. And invite uh, you to join us if you haven't already. We'll be meeting on Monday night at 7 o'clock and the uh, announcements will have the, uh, the login information for you. You can either log in through Zoom or you can call in on your cell phone. As we come into a time of worship this morning, let's pray together. Loving shepherd, you know our names. You care for us. When we face darkness and death, walk beside us. When we hunger for your love, fill us with your presence. When we are fearful, feed us at your table. May we dwell in the house of goodness and mercy all the days of our lives. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
this morning is John chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for my sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. For I have received this command from my Father." Well, it's good to be with you again this morning. It just occurred to me after I did my message with you last Sunday morning that I've never met you in person yet. It's been seven weeks or more now that I've been your pastor here at Myerstown, and I haven't met you in person. And I can't wait till that happens. And I'm sure you've been anxious to get back to things more normal, too. You've been out of school for a while now, and you've been away from your friends and family. I know what that's like. A year ago, my oldest son and his wife and my three grandchildren moved to the Netherlands. Do you know where the Netherlands is located? It's about 4,000 miles away on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in the continent of Europe. Now, we haven't seen them for about six months or so now. We visited last August. And we were supposed to visit in April, but because of the coronavirus, that didn't happen. But you know what? We keep in touch. We keep in touch through Skype and emails. And and in fact, my wife, Kathy, gives my oldest grandson, Will, a saxophone lesson over Skype. So that's good to have all that technology to keep in touch. I bet maybe you're keeping in touch with your friends and your family that way, too. But it's not quite the same as being there, is it? You know, we do a virtual hug when we hang up on Skype, but it's not the same as as hugging our grandchildren. And we don't know how long this is going to go on. No, and we don't know what things will be like after this time as well. But there's a Bible verse that keeps inspiring me, and I I hope it's one that you can remember too. It's in Philippians chapter 4, and it's verse 11 where Paul says this, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I have learned to be content in every situation. Do you know what contentment means, what it means to be content? Well, I think simply it means I'm okay. I'm okay. I can get through this. And I know that things are not the way they're supposed to be or normally have been, but... I'm going to get through this. I'm okay. And you know why 
I'm okay and what that verse speaks to me because I know that whatever happens, whatever our situation, Jesus is with me. He's with me each step of the way. He's with me in the good things and he's with me in the bad things. So you might want to look up that verse in your Bible. Philippians 4, chapter 11. I've learned to be content with whatever I have, with whatever my situation might be. Let's say a prayer together. God, I thank you for these children and that you would ask that you would be with them and just remind them and let them know in, a, in very real ways that you are walking with them as they go through this time of being off from school and being home, away from their friends and away from their family, that you are with them. You care for them. You know their name and you will bless them. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we continue in the church season of Eastertide. And over the last three weeks or so, we've been looking at some of the experiences of Jesus' disciples following his resurrection. In my midweek messages and, and sermons, we've considered people like Thomas and Peter and, and, and several of the other disciples' experiences of the risen Christ and all the different thoughts and questions that were swirling in their heads. Who, who was this Jesus who was alive and then dead and now is alive again? We've talked about how we now live from the perspective of Jesus' resurrection, that through our confession of faith in Jesus, we're born into a new family. We become citizens of a different world. In the years and centuries since Jesus' time on earth, questions about who Jesus is are still being asked. The large number of movies and TV shows and books and articles that, that appear especially around Christmas and Easter are evidence that people are still wanting to know who is this Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we still deal with questions and maybe sometimes even some doubts and are still seeking ways to express who Jesus is. Well, the gospel writers each tried to give us a picture and an understanding of Jesus Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us a fairly straightforward chronology of Jesus' life and teaching. But the Gospel of John, opening with its grand image of, of Jesus as the very Word of God made flesh and living among us, gives us images and portraits of Jesus so that we might know and believe. In fact, in John's Gospel, he quotes seven of Jesus' I am statements which are Im images and metaphors Jesus used to help us understand who he is. In John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. In John 8, I am the light of the world. In John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 15, I am the true vine. And then in today's text that we read from John 10, I am the gate, and I am the good shepherd. Well, while John is trying to help his readers understand who Jesus is, it's obvious in reading his gospel and the others as well that, that many times people didn't understand. Some asked Jesus to show them miraculous signs so that they could believe him. Some asked him directly, who are you? Or what do you mean? In chapter 9, John tells of Jesus healing a blind man. Jesus dealing, did that healing on the Jewish Sabbath, and it caused quite an uproar, even more questions and division among the people. Some of the Pharisees said, This man, Jesus, is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, But how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among the people. In verses 19 and 21 of chapter 10, John reminds us again of the division and the questions surrounding Jesus. John writes, when he said these things, some people were again divided in their opinions about him. Some said he's a demon possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? And others said, this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Well, Jesus made some very bold statements about himself. For his Jewish listeners, his I am statements reminded the people of God's reply to Moses when he questioned what he should say if the people asked him what God's name is. And God replied, I am who I am. 
Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And by using that phrase, I am, and then by calling himself also the good shepherd, Jesus was identifying himself with God. Remember those words from the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, God says, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. I myself will tend my sheep. I will shepherd the flock. In the Hebrew scriptures, God is identified as the good shepherd. And if you read on in chapter 10, Jesus claims about himself led people to pick up stones to, to try to kill him. He asked them, for which good work are you going to stone me? And they answered, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You are a mere man claimed to be God, which indeed Jesus was claiming. They heard, but they didn't understand this good, but not so simple shepherd. Yet Jesus' metaphor of the shepherd and the sheep should have resonated with those people in that world 2,000 years ago. I don't know about you, but I haven't had a lot of experience with sheep or with shepherds. From the biblical record, I, what I do understand about sheep is that they're not known for their intelligence. They're quite vulnerable to thieves and wolves, just as Jesus mentioned. They don't have many ways to defend themselves from predators, and they depend on the protection of the shepherd. In an open pasture land, they have a tendency to wander from the flock and the protection of the shepherd. Now, on the other end of the spectrum from sheep, we human beings are God's most complex creatures. We have the capacity to understand and process huge amounts of information. We can make complicated decisions. We go from pretty extreme lengths to we go to some pretty extreme lengths to defend ourselves. We're not very much like the sheep. Yet I think Jesus recognizes something about us that we might have some difficulty seeing in ourselves. Jesus recognizes that we really do have some of the same tendencies as sheep, and that perhaps we're more like sheep than we realize. Therefore, we too need a shepherd. I also don't know a whole lot about shepherds and shepherding, except for what I've read and what Jesus talks about there in John 10. He said he's the gate for the sheep. And I've read that shepherds would gather the sheep into the sheepfold and would lie down and literally be the door or the gate to the sheepfold to protect the sheep from the wolves, from thieves and other dangers. A good shepherd would literally be willing to lay down his life for the sheep. A good shepherd had a vested interest in the welfare of the sheep. He will not desert the flock when danger comes. Jesus also tells us that shepherds know their sheep and their sheep know them. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. And when they wander, they'll respond to the call of the shepherd's voice. Well, while we might be God's most complex creatures, Jesus says we're a lot like sheep. Like sheep, we do have a tendency to go where the grass looks a little greener. And we also can find ourselves straying away from the good pastures getting lost and finding ourselves in danger. Like sheep, we can easily give in to those who prey on our vulnerabilities. Like sheep, we can sometimes find ourselves at the mercy of those hired hands, people who really don't care about us and are just looking out for themselves. It's our human nature to want to be in control of our lives, yet, yet if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, we have to acknowledge our spiritual likeness to sheep and our need for a good shepherd because it's in following the shepherd that we'll be led to life, real life. Curiously, in the middle of this metaphor about sheep and shepherds, Jesus says this about himself and the sheep. He says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Without the shepherd, the sheep don't have much of a chance for life. They're vulnerable, unprotected, subject to the wolves, the thieves, the whims and fears of those hired hands who really don't care about the sheep. But a good shepherd knows his sheep, and the sheep know him. They know his voice. They know he cares. They know he will protect them. 
He will lay down his life for them so that they may have life, real and abundant life. Abundant life. That phrase, maybe as much as any in the Bible, captures what I think people are looking for, including, I would imagine, all of us. An abundant, full, and satisfying life. Not just longer life, but abundant life. Not just more stuff to make life more fun, but real life. Jesus is making a really big, huge, life-changing promise here. There are a lot of hired hands out there today who also promise abundant life. But it's in abundance, it's an abundance which is understood as having more. More money, more possessions, more cars, more Facebook friends, more, well, you can fill in the blank with all those things that are promised to give us a more satisfying life. Have you noticed how the TV commercials have changed in the past two months. Instead of telling us about their products, the advertisers are telling us how they're one with us during this time, that they're here for us now and and will be when things get better. The problem is I don't think that's a promise they'll keep. At some point, they will go back to selling a product. And more often than not, the abundance of more is going to lead to the the poverty of more rather than to abundant life. So what is this abundant life Jesus, the good shepherd, says he's brought for us? What does it look like? Now, you might be thinking in our circumstances today, how can the preacher be talking about abundant life with so many people suffering from COVID-19, with so many who have lost loved ones, with nearly 30 million people who are unemployed. Abundant life seems something of a dream in the world we're living in today. I wondered this week if the times that we're in right now will change us. Obviously, our experiences of the past two months have already changed our routines and what we've known as normal. But will this experience change us in any ways in the days beyond COVID-19? Are our experiences today giving us a different perspective on what is important, on how we see other people, on what it means to live in these days as a follower of Jesus? Well, let me suggest that if we don't come through these days with a new or renewed understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, then maybe we've given in to that thief who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Because Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And with these words, Jesus makes several things, I think, profoundly clear to us. Jesus affirms our desire for a well-lived life. And he wants us to experience life as God intended it to be, abundant and full. And he warns us that there will be people and powers that will work to steal this abundant life from us. He tells us that life, abundant life, is found in him. God has given us life. So obviously life must be important. And a well-lived, fulfilled, and abundant life, the kind of life that God desires for us, is even more so. One of my favorite contemporary Christian songs is titled Thrive by the group Casting Crowns. Here are some of the lyrics of that song. Here in this worn and weary land where many a dream has died, like a tree planted by the water, we never will run dry. In your word we're digging deep to know the Father's heart. Into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Just to know you and make you known, We lift your name on high. Shine like the sun. Make darkness run and hide. We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. I think we all want more than just to survive. We want to thrive. 
to not simply exist, but to flourish, to find a sense of meaning, purpose, and fulfillment, to be known and accepted. We make all kinds of sacrifices, time, health, resources, in the hope that we can somehow earn, achieve, or buy this kind of life. When our children were young, we couldn't afford to go out to eat at the good restaurants. So if we went out, it was usually to a fast food restaurant. And usually the kids would ask for the kids' meal. That skimpy burger between two just as skimpy buns, a half dozen frozen french fries, and, and a small drink. But the food wasn't what was important. It was the toy inside. So, they would, so, so that they would eat their meal... Kathy and I had a rule that you couldn't open the toy until after you finished eating. Well, as the kids grew up, especially when our two boys became teenagers, they would want the big, supersized double burger, giant fries, and probably what had to have been a half liter of soda. Now as adults, forget the fast food. They want the good restaurant where they can get that thick, juicy steak and all the fixings. I wonder, how often have we settled for the toy, for something less than the abundant life Jesus promises? Have, have you ever taken a serious look at your life, the choices you've made, the, the principles you've built your life upon, the things you've relied upon to, to bring you a meaningful and purposeful life? Have you asked yourself if it's working? I would be surprised if in the last two months, you haven't done so. And let's be clear, Jesus is not promising a life of abundance, but rather an abundant life, and there is a huge difference. You can be unemployed, not knowing when or if another paycheck will ever come, and still experience the kind of abundant life Jesus is talking about. And you could be a multi-billionaire and never come close to the kind of life, an abundant life that Jesus is talking about. Actor Jim Carrey once said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. I grew up next door to my grandparents. My grandfather worked in the condensing department of the Hershey Chocolate Factory for well over 40 years. And after they got married, my grandmother never worked outside of the home. Well, maybe it was because my grandfather grew up in the mountains of Virginia as one of 13 children, but he was great at repurposing almost anything. If something broke or wore out, parts of it could be used for something else. And my grandmother once wasn't much different. One of the, to me at least, strange things I remember her doing was she would wash out plastic bags and hang them on her clothesline to dry so that they could be used again. Not much anything had just one use. Well, in these days of, of single use to almost everything, and the, the mindset of my grandparents almost seems foreign. They never gave the impression that they were lacking for anything. In fact, they shared what they had with anyone in need. Produce from their garden, the cherries, apples, and pears from their fruit trees. They were some of the happiest and most loving people I have ever known. They served as deacons at the church. Their door was always open to my brother and I. And one of my most precious memories is of times that I would walk into their house in the evening and find them sitting together at the kitchen table with their Bibles open, sharing in devotions and prayer. And even though they are gone now for nearly 25 years, they were and continue to be an inspiration for me as an example of those who lived this abundant life that Jesus has promised. A couple of years ago, I attended the Willow Creek Leadership Summit, and one of the presenters was author Patrick Lencioni, and he was speaking about a book he wrote, The Three Signs of a Miserable Job. He said he wrote the book in response to some figures he saw from a Gallup poll that revealed that 77% of Americans hate their jobs. This figure intrigued him because it reminded him of his childhood and watching his father trudge off to work and then come home, letting everybody know how miserable his day had been. He says he came to the frightening realization that people spend so much time at work, 
yet so many of them are unfulfilled and frustrated by their jobs. Now you would think that the measurements of job satisfaction would depend on things like salary, job responsibilities, benefits, or, or the chances for advancement. But what Lencioni found was that being miserable has nothing to do with the actual work that the job involves. He says a professional basketball player can be miserable in his job while the janitor cleaning the locker room behind him finds fulfillment in his work. A marketing, market, <clears throat> marketing executive can be miserable find, making a quarter of a million dollars a year while the rate, waitress who serves her lunch derives meaning and satisfaction from her job. Well, he found three kinds, three signs that are the kind that are kind of like those thieves that come to steal, kill, and destroy and take away from job satisfaction. And the three things he found are anonymity, irrelevance, and what he calls immeasurement, or not knowing how you measure up. And coincidentally, I think these three signs relate very too well to what Jesus is telling us about abundant life here in John 10. Jesus gives us a different set of standards to measure our lives. He came that we might have life and have it abundantly. So what does this life look like? Well, I think when it, what it really comes down to is that there are three things most every person wants in life. Three things that are in contrast to Lencioni's three signs of job dissatisfaction. Three things that best describe a life lived abundantly. And the first one's this, quality relationships. We want to know and be known, to accept and be accepted. Jesus said he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. It's a basic human need to be valued by someone, and it's a basic human responsibility to value others. The problem is quality relationships involves some vulnerability. We forfeit Jesus' abundant life when we spend too much of our time and energy protecting ourselves and giving the impression that we really have it all together. In doing so, we don't let ourselves be known. We want intimacy and honesty in our relationships, and yet sometimes we hold back. We don't risk exposing ourselves out of fear of rejection, not just in our human relationships, but also in our relationship with Jesus. Quality relationships require being vulnerable, letting ourselves be known, and then accepting others when they let down their walls as well. If a basic human need is to be valued by others, Jesus has got this. He knows us by name. He values us, and he cares about us. In a world where the operative principle is always wanting, doing, or being more, Jesus offers an abundance of love, grace, and hope. He knows us, and we can know him. He accepts us for who we are. And the church, with its emphasis on community, is to be a place where everyone knows me, well, at least enough people know me, to satisfy my need to experience quality relationships. Quality relationships beginning with a relationship with Jesus and then with other people. It's a significant part of a life lived abundantly. And second, I think an abundant life is a life of significance. It is to have a sense of meaning and purpose for our lives. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Jesus' kind of abundant life is experienced when we find a place. The love and the care of the good shepherd has a purpose. Jesus sees us as people who can make a difference. In him, we're not just saved from the dangers of life apart from God. We're also saved for a mission of sharing the abundant life in Christ with others. While Jesus came to bring us an abundant life, he also asks us, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. A life of significance isn't based on a job title, on what we produce, or on how much we make. Patrick Lencioni says, no one gets out of bed in the morning to program software or assemble furniture or do whatever it is that accountants do. 
They get out of bed to live their lives. And their work tasks are merely a part of their lives. Abundant life embraces a larger vision of life and of our place in the world. As Paul said, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. No matter what our job, our family, or the life situation in which we find ourselves, we can find significance when we see our primary purpose as joining God in fulfilling God's purposes for the world, those purposes God prepared in advance for us to do. An abundant life is an outwardly focused life, concerned about how much one gives rather than how much one gets. A life lived abundantly is a life that positively impacts for God's purposes our family, our workplace, our school, our neighborhood, wherever we might have opportunity to influence the world around us. I saw that abundant kind of life, a life of significance in my grandparents. They never became famous or rich, but their lives were of significance and influence for their family, their neighbors, and their friends. That's a kind of abundance that can be lived out and experienced even in the midst of a pandemic. Well, then also, the abundant life Jesus offers is a life of contentment. To not simply exist, but to thrive. To come to the end knowing we've had an impact and that our life has counted in some significant way. What drives many people is a fear of being disappointed in the end. That they'll come to the end of their lives realizing they've missed something. So we try to cram as much into our living as possible, not realizing that we're just running in circles. Lots of movement, but going nowhere. Lots of projects, but no purpose. And then there is Jesus, through whom we discover that the point and the purpose of life is not found in resumes or riches or in busyness, but in knowing a person. In knowing and seriously seeking to pattern our lives after the life of Jesus, our lives take on meaning and purpose and significance, and that we can find, in that we can find contentment, that peace that passes all understanding. There are many thieves and bandits in this world who seek to rob us and cheat us out of this wonderful gift of abundant life. Marsha Hornock wrote this rephrasing of the 23rd Psalm, I think, which describes this thief who can steal our contentment. This is what she writes. The clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me lie down only when exhausted. It leads me to deep depression. It hounds my soul. It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. Even though I run frantically from task to task, I will never get it all done. For my ideal is with me. Deadlines and my need for approval, they drive me. They demand performance from me beyond the limits of my schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. My in-basket overflows. Surely fatigue and time pressure shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the bonds of frustration forever. We've been given a promise that in Jesus we will find what life is really about. We've been given a gift. Abundant life is not something we can earn, achieve, or buy. Abundant life is a gift from God who loves us so much that he lays down his own life for us. And that abundant life is clearly described in that real version of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Knowing Jesus, we have the freedom to risk greatly, to give generously, to love deeply, to go adventurously, 
not in order to achieve or earn something that might make us happy, but in response to having been given something of immeasurable value. The shepherd still calls us by name, still wants to lead us to green pastures and quiet streams, still wants to walk with us through our darkest valleys, still wants our lives to overflow with meaning and purpose and blessing, still offers us life abundantly in him. Remember these words of Paul from Philippians 11, 4, 11. For I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, or of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In contrast to those thieves and robbers who come only to steal and kill and destroy, and those hired hands who who care only for their own needs and not the needs of the flock, Jesus understands our needs. He understands and offers us an entirely different set of signs to mark a life that is ultimately abundant, fulfilled, and fulfilling. A life filled with quality relationships and of being known. A life of relevance and significance as we find our connectedness to the purposes of God for our lives and for the whole world. A contented life, knowing the Good Shepherd is always with us. Abundant life is life lived with Jesus in the abundant green pastures of the Good Shepherd. It's the kind of life that can even be found in the midst of a pandemic. Let the Good Shepherd show you the way the truth, and real life live in his abundance. Would you join me in prayer? O Lord, our shepherd and God, come close to us now. Come near us in our time of need. Shepherd and God, we need you in our time of anxiety. We need you in our time of economic uncertainty. We need you in a time of a globe-trotting disease. We need you to bind our wounds and pour your healing ointment on our heads. We need the briars and brambles and burrs pulled out of our fleece and skin. Shepherding God, you guide us with your voice. Help us to listen and follow no matter where your voice leads. Help us to trust you. Shepherding God, protect us from the hired hands that do not really care for us and have neglected or abused us in the past. Shepherding God, thank you for your Son, who laid down his life for those who follow him and for those who are not yet in the fold. Lord, we pray for those who don't know the shepherd, whose life circumstances kept them from knowing the good shepherd. We pray that by our actions, our behavior, and our reaching out into the community, they may come to know you. Shepherding God, Renew us, guide us with your love, and renew us with your peace. Amen.